I find it difficult to believe that someone who has been in bed for an entire year could overpower someone in some sort of fight on the ground for, for a gun. The story Ruth Judd told was that Sammy came at her with a gun. And so then I grabbed her hand like this and kept pushed back. And uh, we both had our hands on the gun. And one shot went through her little finger, one of the fingers, I don't know which one, and into her chest, just through here. Then um, a, a one bullet jammed and caught me here in the, in the top of the gun. I had gun grease, a cut here. And we thought Anne came from behind. She got the ironing board from behind the um, water heater. And by that time, Anne was braining her with an ironing board, trying to get her off Sammy. And she reached out and shot at Anne. And when she woke up, she was lying between two bodies. Ruth Judd said that she called Holleran, screamed that, that what had happened and he needed to help. And he came to help and he was drunk and he said, I'll take care of this. And that he's the one who brought the trunks in from the garage. And he's the one who lifted Anne's body and put it in the trunk. And he's the one who was in charge of everything that happened afterwards. He said he had a doctor friend that could take care of things and she should get a train ticket and go to LA to her husband and take the trunks and he'd have someone meet her and dispose of the bodies over there. After listening to Winnie Ruth Judd, Sheriff McFadden went to the grand jury and he forced a new investigation into this case. And in fact, the grand jury indicted Jack Holleran as an accessory to murder. And finally, Winnie Ruth Judd got a chance to tell her story on the stand, but she was hysterical. She was a terrible witness. She screamed and hollered and cried, and she told the story of the fight and how she'd fought back in self-defense and shot in self-defense, and at the end of it, Jack Holler's attorney got up and said, this poor woman killed in self-defense. There is no murder, therefore there can be no accessory to murder. And the judge said, you're right. And Jack Holleran walked free while Winnie Ruth Judd went back to death row. The local uh, individuals here in town, uh, in, in old Phoenix, I guess we should call it, uh, felt that enough's enough and we don't need any more, uh, you know, gossip. And it's better if we just sweep it under the rug and not talk about it. You know, in those days, the governor could not pardon anyone unless the board of pardons and paroles approved it and recommended that. And this board of pardons and paroles was not about to do that. But there was one other caveat, and that was that the warden of the state prison could ask for a hearing if he thought a person was insane and therefore not eligible for the noose. And that's what happened. He wanted a sanity hearing to figure out if Winnie Ruth Judd should indeed be hung or not. And right before, 48 hours before, she was supposed to hang. A jury there declared her insane. God only knows how that uh, came about, about being changed from being a convicted first degree murderer to insane and send her off to 24th and, and Van Beer. And there was certainly some, some backroom goings on <laughs> about it. And I don't think you'll find any court transcripts to explain the truth. A friend of mine referred to it as the McNaughton plea where they, they could not, uh, in other words, she was insane since the, uh, the, the act, not before or not during. All of this played out at a time when Phoenix was a very hot city, when there was no air conditioning, there was barely swamp cooling. And in the summertime, families that could afford it went to cooler climes. Some went to San Diego, many went to Northern Arizona where they had little cabins for the summer. And that left the summer bachelors, the men who had to stay behind and work all summer and would oftentimes join their families for the weekends. But during the week, they were here, uninhibited by their families or the eyes of their wives. Uh, and they would just suffer through the hot summer in Phoenix. But of course, to help their suffering, there was you know, a bevy of young women, probably like Winnie Ruth Judd, who entertained them. So there was good reason to try to put all the blame on Winnie Ruth Judd to keep all this other stuff secret. Why? That, that's very possible, yeah, very possible, because it would expose things that, uh, let's say, were not necessarily, well, didn't need to be exposed.
They sent Winnie Ruth Judd to the state mental hospital at 24th Street in Van Buren, where she spent the next 30-some years of her life. But she escaped six times to the consternation and fright of Phoenix. She'd run away and there'd be manhunts all over town trying to find her. And they'd find her and they'd send her back. They never knew that Winnie Ruth Judd had the key to the front door of the state hospital. And one year for Christmas, she gave it to me. Mom said go to bed, please door shut, or many reach out, don't chop you up. Second grade, Grand Avenue School in Central Phoenix. Winnie Ruth Judd had been in the, at 24th and Van Buren, which is what we called the state hospital in those days, for 10 or 12 years already, and she had this habit of escaping. Every time she would escape, the Arizona Republic would run a banner headline, Winnie Ruth escapes again. Well, that was news, but to us second graders, we all knew that she was hiding behind a bush somewhere, that she was going to jump out, grab us, cut us up into pieces, put our bodies in a trunk, and ship us to California. We were absolutely petrified. When she would escape, you know, my aunts, my mother has two sisters, and they would kind of worry. I think my mother's mother sometimes would say things like, oh, she's out, you know, we better make sure the doors are locked. Like, when he with Judd was going to go to Minnesota. Stay in the house, lock the door, or when he with Judd's going to get you. Keep you know. the door shut, or when he with Judd's going to chop you up. The myth of Winnie Ruth Judd was so large it has created all kinds of stories. In fact, Jack Williams, who would later become governor and pardon her, claims that he was a young boy who loaded the trunks onto the train. He actually was a young man in those days and a radio announcer, but he remembers it quite differently. I loaded that body on the train, that whole trunk, both the trunks, there were two trunks involved, and put them on the train. You pulled up the baggage car, pushed the trunk on, and then it wasn't until it got to Los Angeles that blood began to seep out of it. Well, you know, I've, I've written and produced about 20 Arizona history documentaries in my History and Heritage of Arizona collection. And, and in one of them, I, I interviewed Jack Williams, former governor, at, about this very thing. He says that he was working part-time, this is before he was in radio, working part-time at the train station. His job was to load trunks onto the train. And he said in it that, my gosh, I, I must have loaded that trunk, those two trunks, on the train. And if somebody says, well, no, that, that couldn't be, I, I can see where he was the guy working there loading trunks. He didn't know he was loading bodies. A week later, when the trunks started seeping, <laughs> and they use the, the term the grizzly find <laughs> on the dock in California, you know, I can just picture this young man saying, oh my God, I loaded those trunks. Winnie Ruth Judd was the most popular person at the state asylum. She was a young, healthy woman in a place that had very few staff and very overworked and underpaid staff. And she became like a member of the staff. She had a beauty parlor and she did people's hair. In fact, women in town went out to the state hospital to have their hair done and would go to dinner parties all over town and brag that this do had been done by Winnie Ruth Judd. She was paroled in 1971 and went off to live in California, a very, very quiet life. She eventually, ironically, moved back to Arizona, where she died in 1998. And over the years, we got to be friends. And she would come to my home, and I would come to her home, and we would celebrate birthdays together. And I came to see her not as the victim who had been railroaded in the 30s, I got to see her as the survivor that she had become, that she was the one who had persevered through all of this. You know, everyone involved in this case was gone before her. They were all long dead. Winnie Ruth Judd outlived them all. All through the press and all through the history of this crime, she's been sort of that body spectacle. And uh, I think it helps to remember that she was actually a person and that um, she really got a raw deal in all this also. Um, she didn't certainly deserve to be murdered and cut up and sent in a trunk to LA. Um, you know, people need to know that uh, there was a personality behind this body.
Winnie Ruth Judd is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.